Hi everyone. Welcome back to Exclusive Machine. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at current mobster Charles Carniglia and the disappearance of John Favara. What happened to the neighbor who accidentally ran over the mobster's 12-year-old son and killed him before disappearing? This is arguably the most intriguing unresolved mystery from John Gotti's opulent gangland career. From Howard Beach in Queens, Favara was a morally upright and diligent person. In New Hyde Park, Long Island, he worked at the Castro Convertibles factory. He was a loving husband and father who had adopted two kids with his wife Janet. In Howard Beach, a middle-class neighborhood divided from the rest of Queens by the Belt Parkway, they reared their family on 86th Street. Favara's immediate neighbors were John and Victoria Gotti, who had five children of their own. Among Favara's children, his son Scott formed a close friendship with Junior Gotti, the eldest of the Gotti children. On the fateful day of March 18, 1980, Favara completed his shift at Castro Convertibles and commenced the 13-mile journey back home. He took the turn from Cross Bay Boulevard onto 157th Avenue, unknowingly heading into the blinding rays of the setting sun. Meanwhile, just 10 minutes earlier, 12-year-old Frank Gotti had taken a ride on a neighbor kid's minibike named Kevin McMahon. With exhilaration, he zipped up and down the streets and sidewalks, embodying the joy of a young boy atop a powerful machine. Young Gotti made his way through a residential construction zone on 157th Avenue, which was only six blocks from his home. A construction dumpster was placed in this location beside the curb. The child moved from the sidewalk onto the street while operating the minibike, positioning himself just past the trash can. As a result of his position, he was hidden from Favara's gaze by the blinding sunshine that produced a blind patch around him. The resulting collision led to a tragically fatal accident. During 1980, John Gotti had not yet achieved the high-profile notoriety he would gain later on. However, Favara was certainly aware of Gotti's escalating status within the world of organized crime. Regardless of the child's Gotti membership, it appears that Favara was sincere in his sadness at his unintentional role in the untimely loss of a youngster. However, the Gotti family lived by their own set of moral principles, and according to the investigators, Victoria Gotti sought revenge by demanding an eye for an eye. Just two days following the regrettable incident, an anonymous woman threatened to eliminate Favara by calling the neighborhood police department. Favara ignored the threat despite the police's warnings about it since he believed that such threats only existed in fiction. Favara started getting threatening phone calls and letters, though. Victoria Gotti's gaze from across the separating fence expressed her rage, which was stoked by the fact that Favara continued to operate the vehicle that had killed her son. The intimidation effort against Favara grew even more intense. A image of Frank Gotti and a mass card from his funeral were snuck into Favara's mailbox as a chilling reminder of the unfortunate incident. Furthermore, on May 22, his automobile was defaced with the term murderer, an obvious attempt to heighten his anguish. Favara sought advice from a boyhood buddy whose father held a senior position inside the mafia organization in reaction to the growing threats. The advice he received was straightforward and urgent, get rid of his car and leave Howard Beach as soon as possible. Victoria Gotti delivered a chilling exclamation mark to these events on May 28. In an aggressive act, she assaulted Favara with a baseball bat right in his driveway, adding a direct physical threat to the psychological torment he was already enduring. He listed his house for sale, and a buyer came soon. The legal procedure was expedited, and the closing date was set for the last day of July. John and Victoria Gotti left New York for a vacation in Florida on July 25. On July 28, Favara walked from the furniture business to a diner two blocks away, where he parked his automobile. A gang confronted him in the parking lot. He was shot, battered, and dragged into a van that raced away. The individual along with his car had vanished completely, marking a decisive departure from Howard Beach. On August 4, after coming back from Florida, detectives spoke with the goddess. Victoria Gotti claimed to be unaware of Favara's fate and said she didn't feel bad if something bad had happened to him. The lack of any gesture, such as an apology or even fixing the car that had caused her son's death, just served to confirm her lack of empathy. John Gotti, her husband, casually said, he killed my kid, and shrugged, expressing the family's deep-seated resentment and desire for vengeance. Throughout the years that followed, informants who were cooperating with law enforcement shared various accounts about Favara's destiny. These stories ranged from suggestions that he was interred in a mafia burial ground in Ozone Park to claims that his remains were encased in concrete and discarded into the sea. According to the widely accepted version, Charles Carniglia, a mob figure, was in charge of the grisly disposal of Favara's bones. According to reports, 
Carniglia disintegrated the unlucky man's body in his scary basement workshop using a barrel of acid. Additionally, it's thought that Gene Gotti, the brother of John Gotti, was one of the mafia figures responsible for kidnapping and ultimately murdering Favara. This horrific occurrence demonstrates the brutal, seedy side of organized crime. In the East New York area of Brooklyn, John Gotti and Charles Carniglia owned a scrapyard that was allegedly utilized for illicit drug trade, the dismantling of stolen vehicles, and the disposal of bodies from mob-related murders. It's claimed that John would take valuables from the deceased prior to dissolving their remains in acid. He supposedly hung these items in the basement as macabre trophies. Around the 1970s, John informally took in Kevin McMahon, a 12-year-old boy he discovered sleeping in his pool house. John Carniglia played a fatherly role for McMahon until he was imprisoned in 1989. Subsequently, Charles oversaw McMahon's involvement as an associate of the Gambino crime family. However, in 2009 McMahon opted to cooperate with the government and provided testimony against Charles during legal proceedings. As time passed, when the Gotti children grew up and started their own families, they each chose to name one of their sons Frank in memory of their late brother. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, reported that before Favar and his family could relocate, he was forcibly taken into a van by a group of men near his place of business. Numerous witnesses observed the abduction, and their testimonies varied, with some suggesting that Favara was beaten with a baseball bat, shot with a silenced .22 caliber pistol, or subjected to both forms of violence. Accounts also differed regarding the disposal of Favara's body. One version indicated that Favara was still alive when he was dismembered using a chainsaw, placed inside a barrel filled with concrete, and then discarded into the ocean, or potentially buried on the premises of an auto chop shop. Favara's wife and two sons left Howard Beach after the kidnapping. He was formally pronounced deceased in 1983. The FBI searched a parking lot in the Hole, New York City, a suspected mafia burial site where Favara's remains may have been buried, in November 2004 as a result of tips from informants. The excavation turned up two bodies, but Favara's was not one of them. Although John Gotti and his family had left for a vacation in Florida three days prior to Favara's disappearance, it is widely believed that Gotti ordered the murder. When interrogated by two detectives regarding Favara's vanishing, Gotti reportedly stated, I'm not sorry the guy's missing. I wouldn't be sorry if the guy turned up dead. In the past, prosecutors had theorized that Favara's body was encased in a barrel of concrete and discarded off a pier in Sheepshead Bay. However, federal court documents filed by prosecutors in Brooklyn in January 2009 contained allegations suggesting that mob hitman Charles Carniglia was responsible for Favara's murder and had disposed of his body using acid. Giacone, Trinchera, and Indelicato's bodies are said to have been disposed of in 1981, according to allegations made against Carniglia. According to rumors, these captains were plotting to have Philip Rostelli, the boss of the Banana organization, taken out. Rustelli requested that the men be ambushed inside a Gambino social club, and Castellano agreed at Rustelli's request. After afterwards, it is said that Carniglia received the three victims' bodies to dispose of them. In a vacant property next to his queen's home, Carniglia is believed to have buried these victims. One of the bodies was found in 2004, though, by youngsters who were playing in that lot. John Carniglia is alleged to have assisted other shooters in the 1985 slayings of Castellano and Bellotti. As they got out of a car outside Manhattan's Sparks Eatery, the two Gambino crime family bosses were ambushed. Witnesses claimed to have seen Carniglia shoot Bellotti as he lay on the ground. Carniglia is allegedly the shooter who struck Castellano in the head with a bullet. According to rumors, John Gotti, Carniglia's captain who wanted to take over the Gambino family, ordered the death of Castellano. Carniglia was allegedly involved in these incidents, but he was never formally charged. Early in 1987, Federal allegations against Carniglia and Gotti included loan sharking, unlawful gambling, murder, and armed hijackings. On March 13, 1987, the trial came to an end, and all defendants, including Carniglia, were cleared of all charges. Later that year, Carniglia and John Gotti's brother Gene were prosecuted again for federal drug trafficking, obstruction of justice, racketeering, and running a continuous criminal narcotics organization charges. However, a mistrial was declared in January 1988 due to charges of jury tampering by the government. On July 27, 1988, a retrial was held, but it resulted in a mistrial because the jury were unable to reach a verdict. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.